Welcome to episode 6 of Taming Tech, the podcast. I'm Paul Oje. And I'm Kathleen Oje. In today's episode, we speak with Lyle O'Carroll, and he is from Sador Africa. He is a technical account manager, and Sador Africa has branches in sub-Saharan Africa, and they're in Zambia, Mauritius, Tanzania, Kenya, and they're part of the Sador group. Today's episode has more of a business focus, specifically how SAP Business One helps businesses unleash their potential. We talk about how an effective tool like SAP Business One allows people to analyze their data, analyze big data, and then take that data and actually use it in their companies. This is the final episode of our first season. Oh, thank God. <laughs> but we'll be back with season two in 2021. So hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on the great guests we have planned. The show notes for today's episode are available at taming.tech forward slash six. On those show notes, we have obviously the transcription. We've got links to all the articles that we talk about. We've got links to Sador, Sador Africa, Sador International, and a little bit of, of what the companies are about. Coming up next is Lalo Carroll. Remember, after this interview, Kathleen and I break it down for you, and we're very funny and interesting. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. How's it, Lyle? How are you doing? I'm good, Paul. It's a, it's a lovely Friday lockdown morning. What can you say? Uh, well, you could say that it's a lovely Thursday, which is worse. It, I, I suppose. Um, you know, it's, I, it's, it's, it, I would have been on leave then too. So Friday on leave is good as well. But uh, I suppose we all got to do what you've got to do in the day. Yeah. Well, I'm very impressed that you actually put on work clothes and you're on leave. That that shows commitment to you. That really, that's <laughs> impressive. Oh, Paul, your podcast is important to me. So we make the effort, don't we? Okay. Well, most people sort of like are just doing the audio podcast. So they can't see how pretty you actually do look. Um, but the people who are watching the video will sort of like get the, the full <laughs> lull experience. So that's <laughs> something to sort of like to point people over to YouTube for that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Lyle, we always start with a couple of things. We do some quick questions just to sort of like get you going, get the, the energy up and get our listeners to get to know you quickly. So quick questions to get to know you quickly. So a whole bunch sure. of things. Okay, ready? Here we go. What is your most used emoji? Uh, sure. Have to be smiley face if I use emojis ever. Okay, so you're not one of those. You're not sort of like effusive on the smileys and the, and the emojis. No, it's, uh, and I think the main reason is I'm a person that uh, enjoys vocalizing. So I tend to find that um, my intentions don't always come over well uh, in tech speak. Okay. Okay. Are you a good dancer? Well, it depends on the time of the evening. Um, it depends <laughs> on the level of courage. Um, okay. and it depends mostly on how badly the other person can see. Okay. Okay. Now that's, <laughs> that's all good answers. And I'm going to move <laughs> quickly past that. Um, when someone finds out what you do or where you're from, what question do they normally ask you? So, look, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting question, mainly because it's very hard for me to try and explain sometimes. So I'm in the business of helping people realize the money they've invested already. Okay. Um, I spent a long time um, with the company I work for, Sador, uh, selling uh, new name business, so that's bringing new customers in yeah. um, and selling SAP Business One. Uh, I think now that I'm in the technical account management, you know, the, the new name sale is out of the way. And what I really focus on is helping people realize um, the benefits of the investment. So what, what question do people ask you? So to be things like, <clears throat> so I have SAP ERP already, SAP Business One ERP already. What are the kind of areas that I can look to unlock my business in um you know i i have these kinds of problems how can you help me uh you're a person who's been in the industry for x amount of time have you seen this before and how did you help other people so a lot of what i do is helping people navigate their way through to an answer um what is your favorite piece of technology wow okay that's a huge question so i'm a bit of a techie um yeah. 
uh, you know, I, I look up over here and directly in front of me, I have my 3D printer. Um, I've got a couple of network bits and pieces. I've got two servers I'm busy playing with. So I, I you know, I, I am the kind of a guy who really gets involved in things. I think if I have to talk about it as a concept, yeah, um, it would be connected technologies. Anything that connects or facilitates the connection to something else, I'm mean, really interested in. So I have, um, I have a lot of interest in automation. I have a lot of interest in... Um, in, in, in getting things to do things without effort. Okay. If you had to pick as a superhero, because that's the obviously important question here, you're a superhero. You can either teleport or you could fly. Teleport or fly. I'd have to say teleport. Very hard to fly underwater. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is the oddest answer I've ever heard. I love it. Um, <laughs> if you had to leave one app left on your smartphone, you had to delete all the other ones, what would that app be? Um, sure. I'd have to say, if I'm thinking about it, WhatsApp. Okay. Reason alone is I use it to communicate to my family, that nothing else matters. All the rest of the stuff can bugger off. Communicating with the people I care about is probably the most important thing to me. Okay, and WhatsApp does the messaging and it does the, the voice. And the and, video calling, yeah. And the video calling. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm Perfect. not endorsing it anyway, though. Okay, now that's fair. Um, we, we, we won't go into how evil it actually is. Um, sure. But whatever communicates with your family is basically the, the app. That's yep. Okay, I like it. Okay, so getting into the, the meat of this, um, you are working with Sador, um, you are working with SAP Business One. Um, and when I hear SAP, I go, well, those are the, sort of like the massive pieces of software. What is the difference between SAP and SAP Business One. Is there a difference? Is it SAP Business One just a stripped down Excel spreadsheet of SAP? What, what is the difference? So I think it's easier to, to understand the similarities. So the similarities are just three things, the S, the A, and the P. Okay. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> there is no other similarity between the products. Um, okay. There are massive benefits though. So SAP has been around for 40, 45 years. Um, they've been doing large ERP, so ERP being a way of connecting all the different aspects of your business together in a way that benefits the different sides. So we've got 40, 45 years of SAP doing that. And, um, you know, we all know the Fortune 500 businesses, the key part of that is that there are only 500. So yeah. if you really want to expand your business, um, you need to start to look at the SME layer. Uh, the SME layer being kind of small to medium businesses, we're talking businesses under 10 billion rand, uh, between a million to 10 billion rand. So SAP Business One uh, caters specifically for the um, small to medium business. It takes the benefit of those 40 years of best practice, um, SAP pouring millions of dollars into R&D and delivers that in a cost effective way to the smaller business. A good example of this would be um, we all heard of kind of big data. Yeah. Um, one of the key things about big data is knowing what to do with it. Now you've got all this information, um, you need to be able to present that. So a couple of years ago, SAP uh, released a product called SAP HANA. SAP HANA is an in-memory solution that actually allows you to be able to actually use that data. Okay. And in the Ali space um, or the large enterprise space, it's a couple million rand um, in our space, it ships free of charge. Okay. So, you know, there's massive benefits to kind of what the large product is doing. Um, and those benefits trickle down. But in terms of similarity, as I said, just the S, the A and the P. Now, the, the, the typical profile of your, let's say, typical, in inverted commas, client, um, yep. what industry... You, you said, like you spoke about the the um, revenue of the of the clients, so a billion rand to ten billion. Um, yeah. What what is is it a million or a billion? Million. Uh, a <clears throat> million rand to ten million, or yeah, okay, cool. Uh, our largest customer is in the is just under ten billion. Yeah. Okay. So what what else is this of like the typical um, profile of a client? So they are typically coming from what I call accounting only solutions. Okay. So the typical business is um, a business which has been trading for a couple of years. Um, they've spent a lot of time working on the operational model of the business, making sure they're profitable, um, cracking the market, uh, making sure that the product that they've got 
has a clear and distinct um, target market. And they've now got to the place where they're spending more time managing than they are actually running the business. So, you know, the story I kind of tell is um, no one ever woke up in the morning um, and uh, was sitting at school as a, as a six-year-old and someone says, what do you want to do? And he says, geez, when I grow up, I really want to be a manager. Bugger being an astronaut. I don't want to be an astronaut. I want to be a manager. You know, that's just, that's not something that happens. It's unfortunately, you know, what, what, what we find in business is that people are really good at particular things. Um, we tend to do exactly what you shouldn't do in business, where we promote them away from what they're good at and turn them into policemen. Um, and, and that is the kind of businesses that, 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 that we um, start to, to get involved with. So they are typically where there are more people managing or policing the business. Um, and what, you know, our kind of return on investment or what our technology really does as a base is frees up those people to be able to concentrate on moving the business forward. So okay. use the skills that, that um, the business saw in them, use the potential the business now has in them and actually realize they benefit into growing the business. The, 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 the thing that, that obviously people are possibly not completely clear on, when, when you say big data, big analytics, um, that sort of stuff, when, when, when we look at, at big data, it might be a thousand rows in an Excel file. What is, mm -hmm. what is big data to you? What, what, what are the benefits of using SAP Business One um, for managing your big data rather than sort of like having a nice big graph in Excel? Sure. So I think what I'll do is, is, is kind of maybe explain what big data really is. It's just simply the collection of multiple sources of information, okay. regardless of the benefit to the business. And that's all we do. We're just collecting information. That's all we do. So this actually grew from the idea that, you know, if we go back uh, 20 years, uh, you know, I spoke about accounting only companies. So this yeah. is where they just had financial information. And uh, we've all heard of uh, month ends and year ends. And, and the real driver for that was, was actually hard drive space. Okay. So what would happen is companies would acquire this information. Um, in this instance, it's financial. And they would start to, computers couldn't process enough of that information. They couldn't hold enough information. And what they needed to do was, like any Excel sheet, create a, a total um, yeah. on the different sections and restart the next month or year. Now, that allowed you the ability to start creating budgets for a business. It started, it allowed you to understand what you bought last month so you don't over-purchase this month. Yes. And that was the start of using data in the business. Now, as hard drives and technology grew, we were able to collect data for a, a whole month and then a whole year and now multiple years. And uh, we needed a term to understand that and that was called big data. The output of big data, what big data really does for a business is it allows you to make good decisions. So we're now sitting in the, in the, in the year of COVID. So let's have a, a very simple example. So if I look at my buying cycles yeah. for last year, and the, um, you know, you know what, what did I buy? I had bought certain commodities or I needed to buy nuts and bolts or PCs or whatever it is. And I say, well, listen, last, this time last year, this is what I was buying. So based on my information, I should be buying this. Absolutely. That's, that's just the way <laughs> sure. projections so, work. And, 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 you know, you can't make money if we don't have product to sell. Yes. Now, in the world of COVID, what you've had to do is say, look, well, if I'm selling that, um, how long does it take me to get that to get that um, that stock? So, at the moment, um, if you're buying things out of different countries, the shipping is now four to five times longer. Yeah. So you need to be making that decision four to five times earlier to be able to to meet your customers' demand. Um, I'd like to believe that customers are loyal. Um, what customers really are are hungry. So if a customer wants a PC, they will come to you because they trust you. Yeah. If you don't have it, they will go somewhere else. Yes. So yes. what we need to do is have that PC for them when they need it. So in a real life example, what big data has really done, it's helped businesses reduce the amount of money invested in the business. So uh, we're either reducing um, our stock or the amount of staff that we have and trying to utilize or turn our money better. 
Okay. So the real output of big data is, is what I've started to call big analysis. So big analysis is where we say, well, listen, we've had this data from last year and the year before, and that tells us that during December, certain clients have this behavior. And in January, other clients have this behavior. Yes. And we also can tell that year on year, we've got X amount of growth or that certain products have been replaced by other products. So how does that influence our decisions? So for me, the big difference with big data, big data tells us historical information, whereas big analysis will help us understand future information. So the one is to substantiate a decision and the other one is to make a decision. Very cool. Does Very that cool. answer your question? Uh, it answers my question and so like takes the next 15 questions off the off the the page right now but <laughs> that's, really that's, sorry. Good. that's good well so like we'll carry on so like talking about your childhood and so like how <laughs> how you were potty trained i'm i'm very excited about all of it um, it's very effective <laughs> it's, it's took me well my entire life okay the potty training yeah yeah yes. no, you use it at least once a day yeah okay let's go yes. let's go boss uh, quickly through this now um so the the companies that are are, are looking to move the companies that you are are targeting the companies mm -hmm. that might be listening to this what what's yep. it like says okay now is actually the time that we should be looking at moving to this kind of thing we sort of like we've been using a, a financial software a pastel a sage a um a fresh books well, or whatever yeah yeah what what now says okay cool we, we now need to move from that to a sap mm -hmm. business one or or something sure. different what what is what is this of like the the fire that's being lit? What's the the incentive? What's the optimum time for it? So it's a balancing act. Um, you know, ultimately, you want to do this when it's in a in in, in a in, in a perfect world. You want to do this when it's not going to affect your business. Okay. So these kind of projects they last uh, between three three to eight months. Um, and during that time, there's a lot of effort from the business. So you need to be able to have the time to be able to actually concentrate on making this kind of project effective. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is exactly the kind of business that is looking for the solution. So there are companies that don't have time. They typically have massive overtime um, because people in management are having to make decisions um, out, um, outside of operational time um to run the business there just simply isn't enough time they they people who the, the business has a feeling that things could be easier yes. they typically are running the business financially but operationally they are probably gurus in excel and have 30 different excel sheets ru actually running the business mm. they may have five or six other solutions which they're which are effective in their own right um but they need them to talk to each other yeah uh, they probably are, uh, they feel they're overstaffed. They've probably for the past three to four years been um, fixing problems with people. So we've got a problem, fine, let's employ someone and that's his job. Yeah. So they tend to be management heavy. Um, they tend to be uh, overstaffed. Um, and they tend to, they tend to have this, this feeling of frustration in that things could literally just be simpler. This is the kind of metric that 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 we that we see in speaking to our clients five six years after um, going with business one or, or or being on go live or, or or having gone live. So, you know, chatting to them, the vast majority of businesses will double their turnover in the next five years um, without taking on extra staff. Okay. So, and that's a very good indicator. So that's telling us that they were overstaffed to begin with. Um, so our return on investment is minimum five years in just staff alone, which is, it's this very scary place for people to be. Also, what you want to do is, you know, it's, I think anyone that's been in business for a number of years realizes that having good staff is key to a, well, to actually growing your business, you know, being able to trust someone, having people that are innovators in the business, having people that really can drive concepts and, and, and understand them and be left alone to run them effectively. Mm. Um, acquiring that talent is a very difficult thing um and secondly nurturing it and keeping it is twice as difficult absolutely so not having to bring new people in the business to grow it 
is a huge, huge plus for many of our clients. And secondly, being able to actually unleash those, unleash those people's potential is, I mean, the, the value is incalculable. Look, the, the thing is that if, you, if you're looking at, at good staff, they possibly will be doing the work of, of three people. And I think that's, that's right. always sort of like the, the problem with good staff is that you sort of like, you go, well, I can trust them with this. And now you sort of like, you know, palm more stuff onto them. Um, and the, the bad staff are the ones that sort of like get half the amount of work. Um, Correct. But if we, if we could actually focus on the, on the good staff, if we could have that kind of good staff, those are the ones that are actually are going to grow a business. Those are the ones that you're going to put your trust in. Those are the ones like our hands teeth sometimes. Exactly. And you know, that, that, that brings me back to my original comment was, which was, you know, we, we, we have, we have these people with this amazing potential with the ability to really invest themselves in, into the business and to take the knowledge, the insight, um, and then, and, and the, um, and to really evolve the business in, in their particular um, departments or industries or verticals. Mm. And we take these, these, these growers of the business and we turn them into those managers and policemen. Yeah. And we tie up all their potential and managing people who have less potential or potentially less potential. And what's important is to really yeah. kind of just release these people um, so that you know, they can realize what usually the people above them have realized already. Yeah, and um, you know they, this has a ripple effect in, into um, staff longevity. You know because they stick around because you know they feel valued and they're doing the things that they really enjoy. Yeah, um, and secondly, is we we see this in business value, in that these are people that have got new ideas in the business that they're unique, um, and that they are typically evolving what we do by just simply allowing that them the time and the space to be able to do that. You've been, because I was, I was stalking your um, LinkedIn, you've been at Sador, which was previously called um, Blue Key, and you've been there for, for 14 years. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions about that. Firstly, 14 sure. years is a hell of a long time. How, how have you become, how are you still interested in one particular product? How are you still interested in one particular company? Um, and you can't sort of like fall back on a loyalty thing. That doesn't work for me. How are you still interested? Because, look, you and I go back a long, long way. You, yes. you are sort of like maybe the definition of an ADHD kid. Um, <laughs> you sort of like you, you want to take things apart. You want to sort of like play with the, the technical things. You want to sort of like be the person who takes the remote control car apart and hopefully put it back together and it works properly. But it will, firstly, it will go much faster. Um, it will have bigger tires. And it'll be bright yep. red because that's cooler. So yeah, I literally have, have you, one sitting over there. <laughs> is it? Okay. So how yes. have you actually stayed interested in one particular product for 14 years? I think it's not the product. The, the product for me is a tool. For me, it's probably the reason that I got into this. So I work for a number of smaller home home-based businesses um, in my early career. I'm very much um, in lines with technology and connected technologies and engineering and that sort of stuff, which is my real passions. I had the foresight or I was, I was lucky enough to work with people that really cared about people and, and that, that really left a really solid impression on me. The second thing is I, was, I saw really good businesses making maybe not the best decisions. And I was at the grassroots of the effect of those decisions. Okay. And I took about six months off, um, which meant I didn't earn anything in my, in my, for uh, about half a year in my early 20s. And I sat in and thought to myself, well, what am I going to do and where am I going to go with my life um, in a business sense where I can really make a difference to those people? And I started looking for businesses that concentrated on securing other businesses, just securing the longevity, the profitability, the people, the meat and potatoes of other businesses. Mm. And it was at about that time um, when I heard about Blue Key and what they were doing. And I didn't really understand it, but I knew that they were, they were a, a business that was pioneering um, 
ELP in South Africa that they had um, a small business family uh, feel about them, that they wanted to make a difference and help other businesses. And I pretty much hounded them for 11 months to get the job. Okay. Um, and yes, I've been 11 years. I started in Cape Town. Um, I spent 10 years um, working and, and growing the Durban office and now I am in Johannesburg. And I think for me, it's, you know, as I said earlier, it's not so much about the product, SAP Business One, which I, you know, it's, it's, it's something I really, really believe in, but it's, it's about what we offer um, and it's about the effect that, um, that we have with our customers. And that is that they are, they feel better off. They feel that their business is secure. Um, in South Africa, we see a lot of businesses where businesses are handed from homegrown older generation to a well-educated but less practical new generation. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of difficulty in translating that knowledge um, and that historical know-how into business acumen. Yes. Um, and a lot of what I work with and a lot of the companies that, that we've had a lot of success with has been around leaving that knowledge behind, having a repository to allow new, well-educated, pioneering type individuals to operate uh, uniquely, maybe a little bit risky, but to have that safety net of good decision-making. And I think for me, that's, that's really what it is. You know, we don't work with any one kind of business. So, you know, this, this, this week alone, We've worked with the hospital groups. Um, I've worked with the engineering businesses. I've worked with electrical businesses right through. So anything kind of engineering to manufacturing, from people management to care management, you know, so that the type of businesses keep changing. Um, but the reality is the problems are, are typically the same. Yes. And that is how do we make good decisions? Okay. So yeah, kind of, kind of digging into that and helping people understand that um, really kind of um, uh, taps into the, the the engineering and that connected technology science side that I so enjoy. So, so basically it keeps you on your toes. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and you know, I think we're very much in a, um, in a cutting edge kind of uh, business. So there's always something new. There's always customers who've got great and grand ideas that would like you to aim investigate for them and that uh, that really plays into who i am as a person um and that keeps me um really interested and motivated in the new technologies and the new things that we can help our customers with 14 years ago you um when you started pretty much everyone had an on-prem server um yeah. everyone had cookie internet um and things like yes. that we are now in 2020 and Thank goodness we have better internet in 2020 because with this lockdown, I, I don't think I would have been still a little bit sane if I was in the 90s in, in lockdown still. Um, no, no, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd all be sitting uh, next to our little our telephone tables. Yeah. Um, probably with a queue of our siblings yeah. waiting to fight us for the next phone call. Well, I mean, I remember in the in the nineties, you and I sort of like spending a good couple of hours um, playing Oregon Trail and Civilization and things like that. And we didn't have any internet for that, so yeah, was maybe awesome. I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it would have been fine. Yeah, I, I think I'm one of those people that still um, starts to laugh when I hear dial-up tones from uh, old US robotics modems. Oh yeah, fourteen four hundreds. Anyway, okay, Absolutely. enough enough of the of that. <laughs> um, so. 14 years ago, everyone had their own on-prem. When did SAP Business One move to the cloud? What was that impetus that, that moved it to the cloud? Was it just cutting edge? Was it people wanted it? What was that, that kind of move looking like? So look, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, I'm glad, it's a very interesting question. So I think the first thing is probably to define what in the cloud means. Yes. Um, Someone so else's computer. Cloud, yeah, basically in the cloud means you take the convenience of, of your computer that was next to you yes, um, and you go put it somewhere else and inconveniently connect to it. Yes. So in the cloud is a very nice way of explaining that you're now connecting to the same piece of tin or hardware um, now not at your location. 
Yes. So I think the, the, the thing to understand is why have we taken something so practical and turned it to something so impractical? Yep. And living in South Africa, um, it makes these, these two key reasons. Um, the one is, um, and you mentioned one earlier, is our state-owned organizations and their commitment to our electricity. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, when, um, when, yeah. when, you know, if you and I are having a chat now and um, my fiber um, shuts down because I might not have electricity running it, it means that I can't take my laptop, which I'm currently chatting to you on, um, put in a 3G dongle and carry on working. Yes. So when you put the uh, the belief of someone who has done an A plus or M plus plus course, um, and you bring them into your business to look after the central nervous system, the architecture, the arteries and veins of your business, that you believe that they're capable of doing that, um, and it turns out that they haven't taken a backup for five months or worse, that they are taking backups but they haven't tested it, that is a real risk to the business. So what the cloud really does um, for ninety percent of businesses. Was it is you're balancing the inconvenience of having on-premise architecture versus the risk of not managing that. Yes. So what we've seen is in our business is as businesses grow, um, we've gone from businesses which had 80% of personnel at a single location and 20% of them remote. So either branches or outbound salespeople. Yeah. to having a 20% administration staff and 80% in either production environments or outbound sales or service management or whatever. So it no longer made sense for those people. It was too risky to have an on-premise solution because if the internet went down or connectivity went down, 80% of the staff couldn't operate. Yeah. So by having a cloud solution, we mitigated that risk and we were able to carry on trading. You know, we, we live in a, in a world now where data needs to be effective, where we need to be able to get to it, where it needs to be achievable. Um, we rely so much on data and simply removing it almost leaves us um, almost impotent where we're unable to make any decisions. Um, we've also trained ourselves and we've trained our technologies and we've trained our customers and suppliers that they can communicate with us in this way, that it's effective. Um, and simply not being able to get to that information and make those decisions or be effective or respond um, leaves us in a very, very tough decision. So the cloud has really kind of taken care of that as, as a business. We're, um, it's left us with new problems. Yeah. So the new problems operating specific um, so either you've only got a Microsoft front end or an IIS front end, or what we see more is mobile or Android um, or Huawei front ends. So we're moving away from a more traditional um, cl uh, client server environment, that's where there are direct connections, into a server web front end or, or app environment. You know, we see more and more on this. I, 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 it'll, think, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, the problem that we're seeing as a business is that these applications are very, very focused and there's massive value in that. Um, mm. But having them talk to each other and cross-linking um, real-time information, uh, I think is the hurdle that we're all at now. Okay. Yeah, look, I mean, that, that is really sort of like the, the utopia of data is that everything communicates with everything in real time. Yes. And you have decisions made on that data in real time. So you guys, yeah. you guys are, are running um, on-prem solutions. You're running um, in AWS. You're running in Azure. You're running pretty much all the pl cloud platforms, aren't you? Yeah. So included on that are Huawei. Okay. Um, we also run both traditional SQL environments um, as well as Linux or SUSE Linux HANA environments. So it, it, it depends essentially on, um, on what the customer wants. We certainly in a, we, we're very much spoiled for choice in today's technology. Mm. Um, but with that, uh, with, with, with that choice um, comes budget constraints, comes growth of the business. Um, 
and we need to have a look at what a, what a business can actually consume. There's no point in giving them all the options in the world, um, which certainly come at a particular price point, but we need to also make sure that that customer um, is able to consume the information in a way that makes sense to them. Mm. Um, it's pointless giving them the real Rolls Royce or the, or the platinum version um, of what's available um, and the ability to use that, the price to use that um, just consumes their, their business. Mm. We're very much about, you know, so we're very much about unlocking potential and what we don't want to do is, is create roadblocks for them as a business. So it's very much about meeting a client um, where they are um, yeah. in, the, in the journey or life cycle of their business. Look, the, the, the thing is that for me with the cloud-based solutions, the AWS, the, the Azure, the, the whatever it is, 10 years ago, obviously that wasn't around. The, yes. the fact that we, we were in COVID times and, and we are all working remotely and things like that, have you found that there's much of, a, of an impact of you guys, I mean, with everything in the cloud, with your teams, with your salespeople, has it changed? I mean, you've also moved from, from KZN um, Natal um, yes. through to Johannesburg. What kind of, what kind of um, things have changed for you in working remotely or has it not? So I think these, these two key things are really st stood out for me. So the one is we certainly are all capable of working remotely. I think, the, you know, I think within the first month or two months, um, I saw a post and an article that just, you know, the headline was the cat's out of the bag. Yes. You know, and it simply talked about how we all thought this could happen. Um, but businesses were a little bit skeptical, a little bit worried, um, and there was no real need to trial it or to try. Um, what COVID did what is it forced everyone to do it. Yes. So what we're definitely seeing is, uh, as a business is we are really looking at um, you know, how, how we will deploy people, how we will look at um, new work and what that means to us as a business and the technologies we need to actually do that. You know, and, 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 and on the back of that, we're seeing two very, very clear types of, um, of problems. So the first is, you know, we, what we talk about as the, um, the water cooler conversations. Yes. So that is where people in the business, and it's intrinsic, it happens in every other business, where we, whether, whether we want to believe it or not, people overhear other people's conversations. And because we all work together, because we're all team we're like, oh, 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 have you, listen, remember to remind them about that. Or yes. listen, my customers just solved that problem. Just put them on hold for two minutes. Listen, John, what you need to do is just chat to so-and-so, tell him we do have a solution. And it's that ability to just converse and we all kind of look after each other and it's that community and family. Mm. Now, how are we going to replicate that and whether or not that is still going to be something we talk about in the, um, in the new norm yeah. is, is something I'm looking to see and, and, and how it will play out. Yeah. Um, and it's a very, very valuable part of our business. And that's what we talk about, those team dynamics, the, um, you know, people caring about people in, in the office, um, that intrinsic knowledge that just travels. Yeah. So that is the, the one component and something that's become very, very um, real, especially to, to me. The second thing is, I, I literally had a call from a customer this week that said, listen, Lyle, we've got X amount of money we want to have a sit down and talk about automating as much as we can in our business. So the reason for this is people want to be able to pick up a mobile device. They want to be able to say, listen, I've, um, John, I've just sat with you. Uh, here's a quote. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've just done it. Just go check your email. Um, it's either in your email or if you're happy, can you just sign my device? So we talked about a paperless society and we have been talking about it for many years. Um, we are now moving towards a very, very um, technology intrinsic society where it's no longer just about getting information. It's about completing the task. Yeah. It's also about metrics. So people saying, well, you know, what have you done today? Because you haven't been at the office. <laughs> um, it's about, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, for all they know, I could have been shopping. You know, it's, it's, it's about, have you been effective? You know, have you spoken to John lately? What did you chat about? It's about you maybe being ill and someone being able to pick up what you've been doing. Yeah. So there's this massive automation 
that I think we'll see more and more of and actually just leveraging on existing technologies. And I think there's the other side, which is the real um, people aspect of us moving away maybe from a you know, people-based businesses um, to more these, these, these automated businesses or um, these more automated businesses, but trying to find a balance between the two. What's actually happening now is it, it, it makes me believe that people were very focused on the, the micromanagement. This like, have you yes. done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? It's more about what is the effectiveness of what you've done? Has the person bought the thing? Has the person been satisfied with your service rather than the each individual tasks? And I think when we start looking at that as a, as a business overview rather than sort of like the micromanaging, it actually might be more positive. Um, it will also weed out the bad workers versus the, the exemplary workers that you spoke about earlier. Yeah. Um, because you kind of, instead of micromanaging them, go, okay, well, you did 15 tasks today, but you still achieved nothing. Um, yeah. You're actually basing it on achievement. You're basing it on how they actually work. Yeah, so, you know, I think, we, I think we've, we've been a very reactive society for a long time. Mm. You know, um, someone phones, we pick up the phone and we sort the problem out. Yeah. Um, someone has a need, we address that need. Um, you walk around a corner, you kick your toe, you shout, ouch. You know, it's, it's, it's very much a reactive society. What I think we're going to see um, is we're going to move into a, a business-centric society where we're going to be doing more planning. So we're going to say, you know, I don't have these three tasks, but in five, six days, a month's time, five years' time, these are the things I need to have achieved. Yes. And we're going to be, you know, we don't need to be monitoring all the things that are going well. We don't need to be monitoring or seeing all the information our staff is doing accurately. We just want to react. We just want to affect or make a difference where people are battling. Yeah. And I think in doing that, we'll free up a lot of our time. You know, in, in, in um, a lot of our customers, they... <laughs> Maybe they're a bit sick of it, but they will certainly understand my phrase. I call them coffee cup reports. So these are the little reports or, or pockets of information that you typically sit with. You get to the office, you uh, have your cup of coffee. It's, uh, you know, you, you take the next five to 10 minutes to just look at what's not going well. You know, I don't need to spend 20 minutes understanding that my production environment is working well. I don't need to understand that my staff are doing all the things they're supposed to do. I assume that's happening. It's yeah. part of their KPIs. What I need to do is understand where I can be effective and help them. And that's, that's the key part where, of, of what I think are, where we're moving to, is we're going to stop being, as I said earlier, policemen, yeah. um, and we're going to start becoming confidants. We're going to start um, to grow um, our staff. And I think what we're really going to do is, is move from, is, is move towards what we properly think of as leaders, is people that have information and are going to help and deploy that. I think people listening might go, that's a, that's a wonderful thought, but I've got this, this idiot back at the office who um, I will never trust and I am going to micromanage the hell out of him because he is stupid. And I think, I think, Fair I think that basically we just need to realize who the people that we need to count on and who the people that we can't. There, there will always be people you need to micromanage. There will always yeah. be people that require more effort. Yeah. I think the key is, um, is having the time to do that. Yeah. So if I didn't have to micromanage everyone and I only needed to micromanage one or two people, mm. then that would be great. You know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not infallible. Um, I have managers just like everyone else. 99% of the time, um, my manager will trust me to get on with what needs to be done. Um, but like everyone else, I have weak points. And uh, without doubt, there'll be one or two things and you'll phone me or you'll message me, hello, just a quick reminder to get this done. Yeah. Now, he has time to follow up on that. Yeah. Um, he understands that I'm a person like everyone else, that I'm... You know, I, that, that I'm concentrating or I have interests or that my priorities lie in different areas. 
and that he does let, need to let me know that these are certain things that still need to be done. And because he has the time to do it, it helps me become more effective yeah. um, and it helps him be more effective and, sh and shine to the people he now uh, has to uh, chat to. So, you know, it certainly, you know, it happens in all aspects of the business. It doesn't matter how good you are, how, whether you've been in the business for 14 years or if you've been there for two months. Yeah. What it does do, it just allows the, the people around you to make sure that you're as effective as, as you should be. And, 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 you know, to really reach the potential that we all really do have. What, what is the, the next, I hate this question, but what does the next five years entail for technology? I mean, we didn't realize in 2019 that the amount of development that had to happen in 2020 was going to happen. Um, I've seen people's um, tasks and, and goals for their roadmaps of their software have like been thrown out the window completely um, during this yeah. year. And they said, like, focus on video communication and things like that. So what, what is the, is automation the next big thing in SAP One, uh, Business One? Is it um, analyzing big data? What, what, is the, what is the thing? What is happening in the next five, 10 years? As a technology, there's probably a, a couple of key points. So one is um, we're certainly moving more and more to a, a mobile um, workforce. I think we're gonna see a lot more technology and applications. Um, I think we're going to see um, a lot more um, investment into areas that are more communication based. So we're talking about um, things like um, integrating communication platforms um, to being able to access fringe data to make decisions. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think we're going to see a lot more KPI um, and, and analysis driven information to help us make better decisions. And that's more from a technology side. So I think we, you know, we're going to move more away from operating systems um, and more to a consumer-driven um, interfaces. More agnostic in terms of the operating system. If you're on Mac, if you're yeah. on your phone, if you're on Chrome. Yeah. So yeah. you know, we're going to what we what what we're going to see is, is is customers are going to want to find easier ways to consume information um, and also easier ways to plug little bits of um, extra information in. And, and to be able to do that, the technologies, the underlying technologies need, need to change. And, and you know, so there's going to be a lot of work there. Um, in terms of business and customers, um, I think, again, we're going to see more community type, type um, uh, solutions. So uh, business to business, um, end to end. So if, if a customer, if, if, one, if one of your customers wants a quote, that there's, there'd be a piece of technology that would simply just, you know, they'd ask for a quote and it would deliver a quote without um, communicating internally within your business. Mm. So, you know, making it easier for your customers to deal with you, making it easier for your suppliers to understand what they need to supply to you. So we're going to see a lot more of this automation, this uh, kind of community solutions. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to see less salespeople or buyers in businesses, and we're going to see more um, uh, account type people. So more people actually concentrating on communicating, actually concentrating on relationships, yeah. um, because that, that's going to be far more difficult for the computers to handle. And we're going to see computers actually look at the automation of the processes or the outcomes of those conversations. <clears throat> you know, the same thing I said earlier, our, our customers, tend to be able to do twice the turnover without taking on more people. We yeah. going to see the same thing. I think people's focuses are going to change. Um, and I think the systems are going to free up time for them to focus on those relationships. So yeah, I think it'll be very interesting. Um, you know, we certainly in, in, are going to come closer into the world of AI, so artificial intelligence. I don't think artificial intelligence is um, will start to take on your meaning. We all thought this is where uh, Terminator and the... Uh, and the, the, the robots will take over the world. I don't think that will, I think we're, we're away a ways from that ever happening. Well, look, if, if, think... if SAP sort of like starts sort of like disseminating my information into sort of like a sentient <laughs> being and starts sort of like attacking me with my own data, I'm going to be yeah. upset. <laughs> yeah, look, so will we. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, you know the, the, the first thing to look at, you know, we've got, we've got, um, Alexa integration, um, we've got all these kind of, uh, uh, 
well, you know, all, all Siri integration, all this sort of stuff. We have um, at, at last just summit, there was a great example of a little robot that ran up a piece of railway track. And while it was running up the railway track, it, it um, was doing these little soundings and found out that a piece of rail um, was starting to age or become too thin or weak, automatically created a service card. And there was all of a sudden from this little robot, a whole bunch of work happened and a lot of businesses now got work and, and value. Yes. So I think that's what we're going to see. I don't think, I don't think businesses will change. I think how we acquire data um, will change. I think businesses will become safer. Um, I think they will become um, easier to deal with. I think that we're not going to have customers and suppliers who are shouting and angry because we're going to have technologies that will address or find those issues before they happen. So mm. I think what we're really going to have is a far more beneficial society. Um, and that's where AI is going to fill the gap. Um, but it's certainly going to be interesting to see how that happens. Yeah. So yeah, certainly, uh, again, playing into my love of technology, yeah. um, I think it will be interesting. Well, I think that's that's all the questions I have for you. Um, I think that you have um, broken down your love for your technology quite beautifully. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, where can people get hold of you? So I think the easiest place is, um, is to grab me on my email or my LinkedIn pages, um, the okay. details of which I understand are, are attached to the podcast. Um, you're, of course, welcome to find our offices at Sodo and reach out directly. Uh, um, I'm always happy to have a chat and to help people. I'm interested in building relationships, even if uh, initially um, they aren't financially beneficial. What interests me more than anything at the moment is just helping people understand and unlock the potential in their businesses. And maybe if we have to do that over, over a beer or, or, or a cup of coffee and, and really kind of understand where other businesses are at, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd love to share my knowledge and my passion for the industry. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Thanks so much, Lyle. And I will speak to you soon, I, I'm sure. Thanks, man. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Have a good yes. Friday. Stay safe. I will. You too, man. So what did you get out of your discussion with Lyle? Not much. He was kind of boring. I found him sort of like frustrating. He, you know, he's sort of like, I'm lying. He's one of those people that fascinates the hell out of me. He has so much energy. He works with so many different industries and he understands the businesses and how they work in all those industries. And he can take a simple idea or a simple process, break it down or make it more effective for you. And I just love that. Or more likely a complex idea and a complex process. Possibly, yes. Yes, breaking down simple ideas is not that exciting. No, not that difficult at yes. all. What I find interesting about Lau is how he has taken his skill and his love and his ability to dismantle things, typically mechanical things, and he's translated it into a business environment. I think that he's in the embodiment of taming tech and benefiting people, um, which is the intersection that we always love. Absolutely. I think that this gives him immense satisfaction, and I think that comes across in this discussion. Yeah, so I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, I think that translating the mechanical and the systems and breaking that down um, and benefiting people is really the crux of it. I think that systems are integral to any business and the success of a business, but they shouldn't be obstacles and they shouldn't be hurdles. And it should make it easier for your staff, for easier. your clients. Yes, yeah. for your business. And yeah, and definitely for your staff. And then I thought it was also interesting, the conversation around staff and managers and managers being able to become leaders and to develop staff and thereby give, these businesses are able to give their managers the ability to develop and develop staff as well. It's like they're removing that element of management that isn't really fun and enjoyable that nobody really enjoys. And if you do enjoy it, you know, perhaps you need to look at that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's really great. Breaking that down even simpler, Lyle sort of like used to take apart cars. He used to put them back together and they were faster and they were more exciting and they sort of like had speed stripes and they were red and things like that. And if Lyle can do that for a, a simple thing like a radio control car, for you as a company, as, a, as an employee, for you as a manager, he can do the same thing for you. He can take your complex structures. He can take everything that you are battling with, um, whether it's disparate systems, whether it's anything that, that hinders you in doing your, your business properly or takes away from your core focus of your business and actually allows you to do it better. 
look, I'm sure he won't paint your, your company red unless you really want it. You know, we deal with a supplier and the supplier has four or five different disparate systems. They've got an accounting or financial system, they've got a CRM system, they've got an Excel spreadsheet, um, an ordering system. And what they do is when you place an order with them, they copy and paste your information between the different systems. And that just makes it very susceptible for human error, missing something out. And I think the largest part about this, and this is what Lyle was talking about with his big data analytics, is that you can take all your data and actually figure out what's happening. You can project into the future. You can see how much stock you need. You can see whether or not your business is being effective or your managers are being effective or your staff is being effective. And I think that this supplier that we're talking about needs something like that. Absolutely. We should probably refer them to that. And um, I think that the interesting thing about big data is it doesn't matter how much data you have if you aren't able to analyze it. And I think that's what Lyle was effectively saying, is that the analytics and the metrics that you get, that's going to be important. I think that um, I loved the element that we're talking about, about the disbursement of staff. Hmm. I think that um, the disbursement of staff, the opportunities and the choice that people have everybody's looking for more choice i think that this being our final episode of 2020 let's talk a little bit about 2020 2020 has taught us how to that we need to analyze how we live our lives that we need to integrate our personal and our professional more how do we do that that we have to make choices about things and that is different for everybody what works for one person doesn't work for another person and that's true of businesses too and it's true of every single staff member in a company and i think that we are things are becoming far more dispersed they're not as centralized and that is giving us a lot more opportunity for people and i think people in 2020 have learned that they can cannot delay their gratification, their sense of purpose anymore. And I think they're going to want more of that from companies. And the solution gives that, gives companies the ability to provide that to the employees. I think people want more, they, they don't want to be dealing with things that they don't want to deal with anymore. And I think this is for the owners of the businesses, the managers of the business and the, person, the personnel, the employees of the business. I think that we are looking for a more personalized solution in everything, whether we're the customer, whether we're the supplier, it doesn't matter where we fall in the um, business relationship, we all want more choice. And technology can give that to us. Technology is enabling us now to be more human than it did previously. Agreed. That's deep. That is deep. We should finish the, the season on that. So, as we said, this is our final episode of the season. Thank you so much, Lau, for ending it on such a, an amazing note. Absolutely. And giving us so much to think about and look forward to. Looking forward to seeing what's coming out next in terms of what technology can do in making us more human. Oh, that's my motto for the year. It's our final episode, as we said. We have got exciting things coming up in season two, exciting guests. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sinking my teeth into them. The, 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 the interviews, not, the, the, not the guests. That would be a whole new take. Okay? It would. That would be a different podcast. Hit subscribe to see Paul sink his teeth <laughs> into our next guest. <laughs> Hit subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you find your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you in 2021 and may it be better. Absolutely. Ciao.